Hey, what's up, addicts? We're super excited to bring you another vlog style series. What we've done is we partnered up with Kevin, but he also works for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we thought it would kind of be cool to let you into that world a little bit and show you kind of what goes on and how these guys are actually fighting for us and fighting for our fisheries and helping us. So kind of explain what's gonna happen, Kev. Yep, yeah, none of you know already, um, my daytime job, I work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, specifically I do a lot of uh, steelhead broodstock programs as well as some Chinook broodstocking. So a lot of fun stuff, it's big right now, I'm sure everybody knows about broodstock. So what we've done is literally given you a look into my day-to-day -day job, what I'm out there doing every day, five days a week. It's gonna be a three-part series, kind of three chunks. Uh, the first one you're gonna see, you're gonna get a look at our acclimation program. So where we hold and release broodstock smolts on the rivers. So we have these big raceways, hold them, we release them. There's a lot that goes into these processes. It's, there's a lot of challenges associated as well. And you're gonna see a lot of that in, it's real life. in the we're first one. It. It's, the, it's the real deal. The second one, um, we're gonna break down into two different rivers, but it's the same program. Uh, pretty much it's going to be wild winter steelhead broodstock collection, holding, spawning, and releasing at the end. Which is something I didn't know until this year as I started familiarizing myself with broodstocks and a lot of you guys might not know as well, but a lot of these fish they take and they spawn, they then release back into the river and some of these fish go spawn again yeah. or go back out and then come back next year and then spawn again. Or It's just really cool how this program works yeah. and, and I think you guys are going to be super stoked to kind of get brought into the world. Yeah, there's a, it's just, it's gonna be an eye-opening series. I think you're gonna enjoy it. So talk about part three. Uh, part three is gonna be on another river in the, in the metro area. And in this one, I'm really excited because we actually collected a monster wild winter steel, a 40 inch wild. I mean, this, this buck is probably 20 pounds easy. And you get to see us collect him from the angler, who's a significant contributor in our program. So we, awesome. We thank him so much for his work. Um, and we're gonna truck that fish to the hatchery. We hold that fish for about a month and we'll spawn him and you can see us actually live release him back into the wild to either go upstream and spawn again or rejuvenate, head back out the ocean and come back into the stream. Yeah, and I promise you guys, this is something you definitely wanna see. This fish is freaking giant. So please, please, please make sure you guys tap that subscribe button. Share this video out there, share this vlog out there and kind of let people into the world of what Kevin does on a day-to-day -day basis. And know that, you know, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife at the end of the day, guys, they're on our side. They, they, it's in their best interest that we have more fish and that sportsmen are out there catching fish and doing the things that they love in the outdoors. So we kind of wanted to show you guys that, that they're here for us. So make sure you tap the subscribe button, make sure you turn on the little bell notifications and stay tuned for this vlog series that's coming at you, episode one right now. this pond here, we have Hatchery Spring Chinook Juveniles. They are almost two years old at this point. Um, we're set to release these fish in about two weeks. They'll out-migrate to the ocean, and they'll spend two, maybe three years out there where they'll return as either four or five-year-old adults, and they'll hopefully come back to the river and provide ample opportunity for anglers to tap into that resource and take home spring chinook. Here we go, get a hundred yards. It's always a good idea to broadcast feed kind of slowly. If you feed too heavily, you know, they may not get all the food, it'll sink to the bottom and rot. So it's kind of, kind of a bad situation for them if that happens. So we feed a scoop every minute or two so that it gives them time to eat it all up. So here we have our intake and our pump. This is the life support system and supply for our acclimation pond where these 65,000 spring chinook will spend three weeks. Um, this is one of the most important parts of this entire setup here. If this fails, our fish fail. So monitoring things like water level, our screen down there, as well as the pump itself is a key part of day-to-day -day monitoring of the pond here. So every single day we come out and we're eyeballing all these small parts to make sure everything's functioning properly 
because one failure can mean the loss of all these fish and uh, it'd be a significant loss to the fishery. Raising fish isn't always as easy as just feeding them and then putting them in the river and sending them on their way. There's a lot of challenges associated with, with fish propagation, especially at remote sites like this. As you can see, recent snowfall has dropped a tree two weeks ago and that tree nearly took out our pump. Had that happened, we potentially could have lost 65,000 smolts, um, all because of mother nature, you know. Um, another challenge we face is going on right now, as you can see, the river is really low. Should this river get any lower, we stand to risk losing water for our intake system. If we lose water for the intake system, we don't have water going into the pond for our smolts. We'd most likely have to release the fish early, um, which isn't ne necessarily a good thing. We try to hold the fish for three weeks to get them to imprint to this system so when they return as adults, they come back here. What's that? It feels fit. Yeah. I, uh, There's no cavitation or anything, so we're... I opened this one more because it's been riding high and that motor's been making some funny noises. It's still dripping, though. Yeah, keep an ear and an eye on it. I feel like we should do an alarm check because of this. Okay. Most of our acclimation sites are at remote locations, so areas that are distant from the public and hard for us to even get to in a timely fashion. So because of that, we have to run our ponds with an alarm system and an auto dialer box. Without an alarm dialer box system like this, uh, again, it's just a measure that has to be taken place so that these fish can survive and be put into the river for angler opportunity. Without it, we would, we would probably lose the fish. So each and every day, our fish are fed a formulated feed from a company called Bio Oregon. And it's a, a pellet style feed. It's packed full of all the key nutrients and lipids and fats that help these smolts grow to size. So every day, either one of us or a volunteer comes out, feeds the fish, and documents it and just gives us a couple comments on how the fish are doing. Eric and Brad are here. They're our Broodstock program assistants and they help oversee the day-to-day -day checkup and feed schedule on the pond. So they're here every day of the week when our volunteers aren't here. So they kind of work in conjunction with our volunteers to help make sure somebody is at this site every day of the week, making sure everything's up and running to speed. Now that we've finished our morning duties at our Spring Chinook acclimation site, um, we've taken a lunch break, and this afternoon we're going to go to our winter steelhead broodstock acclimation pond on a neighboring system, and we're gonna do some measurements on those fish and prep the pond for a release today. We're gonna release 25,000 winter steelhead smolts. So this is the soft bristle, bristle broom that we use to uh, push our smolts out the pond and out the outflow and into the creek with. So these are nice and soft, they're not going to do any damage to the smolt, but they help guide them from one end of the pond and out and down the drain. The water clarity here is much murkier than our spring chinook site. So being able to get a good dip on these fish and even see the fish on how well they're doing is, is a challenge here. Simply because they can sink down and we can't even see them. Oftentimes we throw a little food to bring them up just to get a, a decent look at them. Eric, why don't you tell them what you're doing here in a sec. Uh, this probe right here will give us uh, a water temperature as well as a dissolved oxygen. For Three or four minutes, this will stabilize. and It'll tell us in centigrade, it'll be probably four and a half degrees Celsius. Um, time to wait for it to equalize. 
It was thir six, three, three last week. Four, five was. Oh. It was four, five last week, and that's thirty nine. So this is forty two, forty one. I'll take it. I bet they'll eat pretty good right now if we fed them. Eleven six bit. four. It's still pretty good. That's actually above average for this pond. Cause it, cause cold. Colder water has a higher affinity to hold oxygen, dissolved oxygen, than warm water. So it's an inverse relationship. Warmer water, your dissolved oxygen level goes down. Colder water, your dissolved oxygen level goes up. And ideally, a higher dissolved oxygen level is better for salmon and steelhead. Kind of see the old wall that Max and I built right here. Yeah. So right now, we're trying to kind of build a, a rock wall in the creek here. We're about to release winter steelhead smolt into this feeder creek. And the rock wall is gonna help usher the fish downstream into a larger pool and help them out migrate easier, easier without stranding the fish throughout the creek. So we're kind of just building a highway for them downstream. Like taking the wall down to about here? Yeah, I would just peel everything to about here and then focus on opening up the channel to right, the river. That way, yeah. yeah. Are we done yet? Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. I'm really annoyed right now because my t-shirt under here has rolled all the way up and it's like under my armpits. <laughs> I know how much that frustrates you. <laughs> Wait, having OCD is terrible. I'm dying right now. Doc does it in your waiting booth. Oh, the worst thing in the world. Just about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the level will raise a bit when that all that excess sure. pond water comes out. So some are going to kind of yeah, go up and over. Down. So we'll just kind of have to pick them out and put them back in the stream. But this looks pretty good. I mean, given the low water, we're looking pretty decent. At least they don't have to come 20 feet from the sky. <laughs> no, th the great thing about this is it's a very soft landing. There's no landing involved. They just come out of the tube. Uh, we'll go get that upper uh, upper section and yeah. snap it on. Yeah, unstrap that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the pond level down. Stand pipe it, but we gotta be ready to go the second we stand pipe it. Uh, we put this end on, kind of situate it, make sure this is pointed in the right direction, then stitch on the long piece, snap it together, and we'll be ready to go. Make sure this bag fits on there. Yeah. So, right now we're dropping the level of the pond a couple of feet, and then we'll put our stand pipe back in. And what that does is it stops the water flowing out of the pond periodically so we can put our smolt release pipe onto the outflow without water flowing out while we're trying to hook it together. So it buys us about 10 or 15 minutes to, to get the flow pipe on and braced and ready for the smolts to be released. Uh, look at it. We want to make sure it's plenty of time so we'll let it drop more. Because I've been out here alone trying to when it turns it up on. When water started <laughs> spilling over and tore the pipe off. Frustrating. I'd start over. So what we've done now is we've cut off flow coming out of our pond. This is the outflow from the bottom of our pond. We've cut off the water so that we can hook up this smolt pipe to the outflow and feed the smolts into the creek. Um, if we weren't to cut the flow out, it would be nearly impossible to hook this pipe up with water at about 450 gallons a minute coming out of there. We're trying to pretty much smush it together as tight as we can do. It's right in front of us. Oh, that's right. Ah, I got you. Lift it up. Lift your end up a bit. There we go. More? All right. That, that feels pretty good. So what we have is a uh, MS-222, it's a, a little bit of a um, 
anesthetic to kind of not necessarily put the fish to sleep, but to calm them down a little bit so that we can handle them and get measurements on them. Try to get another scoop really quick. Try to get a couple of these. So what we're doing here is we're conducting what's called length frequencies. So we take a sample of fish in the net out of the pond, we anesthetize them, we weigh how many fish is in that sample on the scale. And then we take lengths for each and every fish and that length for each fish is documented on a sheet over there. We try to get about 200 samples. At the end of it all, what we can calculate is how many fish per one pound are in the pond. Typically when we release the fish, they are somewhere between about 8 and 11 to the pound. It almost <laughs> like he's done it before. <laughs> That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they were the other day when we tested them. They were right under the white one. We gotta we gotta rotate this down like yeah. 145. 140. 130. Oh. <laughs> 180. Right now we're releasing 25,000 broodstock winter steelhead small. As you can see, they're coming out and into the creek. The creek flows into the main river in which the fish will eventually return to. We are releasing right now in the late afternoon to give these chance of fish to out-migrate over the next 24, maybe 48 hours before they all finally move out into the big river and are safely on their way downstream. A few big balls here that need to move out still. I hear the walk in this corner. I'm trying to gently coax the fish to go down the hole. I've got this uh, soft brush right here, so if, if it does come in contact with a fish, we won't have any scale loss or extra injuries. It's already stressful enough. So we're trying to we're trying to make it think that it's their idea to leave, not ours. But still, they're. They're pretty stubborn. They want to sit in the current. So it's easier to get them out when there's some water instead of, you know, just a tiny bit of water. Classic. Always down to the last 20 or 30. Looks like everyone's out of the pool. Sometimes there's like a little tiny two inch or left in here. But... I think we're good. I, I think the ones that have gone out there, there's a lot of them went out. Look at them. Yeah. Not up, through here. Go back. That way. Go get They'll dink around. They try to go back. They're like, eh, it's easier to go down. So here we are, post release from the pond. Um, and now the majority of our smolts are actually making their way down out of the creek and into the main river where over the next few weeks, they'll begin to out-migrate towards the Willamette, the Columbia, and on down and eventually into the ocean where they'll grow up. All right, addicts, so that's acclimation ponds, and that was a lot of information for me to digest. Yeah. I appreciate it. Talk a little bit about it. So what you guys saw was day-to-day -day operations that are acclimation ponds. Uh, I also pointed out some natural and you know red tape issues that that are challenges to our program as well and you also got to see us release how we release our smolts into the river from these sites which was and cool it's, it's not easy yeah you know, there's a lot to it um but we got her done and i hope you guys enjoyed it yeah so thanks so much for tuning in guys that was part one of this three-part series. So don't forget to tap subscribe, turn on the bell notification, and kind of get engaged with us on these. Let's share these out there and get these out to all the rest of the anglers in Washington and Oregon and kind of let them know what's going on behind the scenes and what we're doing to kind of help the fisheries along. And thanks so much for tuning in. Part two, coming tomorrow.